Maria Pizzuto. She's a key witness here. Key. In her narrative. Now I'll hit it, but I'll let you read it. She formed all the cases against individuals within the state. All the criminal, DRA, tax, everything she did. And then she would give the information to, go back, the, to Morris Mahoney. That formed the complaints that went out. You see those legal complaints? That was the information she put together. Go back. So in putting all this together, she saw the criminality. Now let's take a look at her text. Again, she's now married, start from the beginning. She's now married to Bob Jufris, right? Now I'm going to read you some of her text. She asked me here, can you get on YouTube? Well, I'm going to try. Mike, I have some information that will change the face of this, but you need to be super careful, including your own safety. Remember, all these will be attached. You have to do it convertly. Your safety is in danger. Don't be vocal moving forward. I think you have to understand the true evil nature of things. You have to assume you're up against evil, not just corruption. You have to keep your plan secret. Right? I told you there were spies. She was on it coming into this. Again, Keep, under, keep underestimating the fear factor of the very evil, corrupt group. At the top, it goes beyond criminal. They scare the hell out of the little guy practicing on their own. Many dads are being cut from their children's lives with no evidence. She was now married to one of the power brokers in this whole thing. She is discovering this as I am. And she's afraid that I'm going to be killed. Yes, there is. All big, powerful firms. All the ones you have sued. She's agreeing that the ones we're suing are the right ones. that are running the state. She's saying they're connected to the judiciary. Connected to the judges. This is a closed network protecting one another. What have I been trying to tell you this whole time? But it's really predicting the level of evil. Regular chess moves don't work. Sorry. Call investigators, interview until you find someone you can trust. Hire. Personal security. Mike, I'm saying this for your own good. Stop turning to New Hampshire's attorneys for help. Stop playing right into their hands. Keep your enemy close this time. Play along. Set them up. I can get things done behind the scenes. Then a special thing comes up. And you know what that was? She discovered that Ted and Tony were Spies. I'm 100% sure that Tony's job is to set me up the way Dollar is. Remember? Dollar was my attorney. They've got her in hiding in Oklahoma worried to be killed. You see? She's starting to put that together. Tony hasn't changed his job on the BBO. He still works for himself. Clean taxes. See, she knew the IRS was a place to go. Now watch. This is very important. Obvious, Ortiz office got a call when they had a heads up. Simple thing to do. Let's go back for a second. You see that with Ortiz office? Let's visit Miss Ortiz. You know who Miss Ortiz is? She's the U.S. attorney in Massachusetts. Mike, I'm 100% sure about Tony. 100%. He's going to sink the whole thing and get a private investigator and forensics. Tony was handling, guess what everybody, the DRA. Right, and going after Morris Mahoney. It was all a setup. Mike, on LinkedIn, can you see Tony with the same department as Nick at Morris Mahoney? And his claims to have saved tons of money for the insurers. Now think about that. I will watch it again. Zero Dark Thirty movie. Catching Bin Laden. It sounds like the same terrorist organization in New Hampshire. Legal terrorists. You see? You will never get justice. And she left after that. And I'll explain.
I'd like to submit this as evidence. This has just happened to be called a narrative or a chronolog chronology, which was number one. This is a narrative that Miss Miss Prosciutto was. Well, when I tag that first, yeah, nice. <coughs> supplied to you directly. So, did you write the complaints yourself? I physically typed it onto a computer based on information provided by you, Mr. Jutras, Ms. Pizzuto, Mr. Heider, and perhaps other of your attorneys. So, so you didn't write it, you typed it. Is that your testimony? Uh, yes. So you're a typist? <laughs> I would not call myself a typist. Well, did anyone else type it? Physically type it? No, not to my knowledge. So you were the one who typed it. So, in putting all this together, did you have any help in putting it together, or did someone, for instance, like Nick, review it thereafter? Uh, yes, Nick reviewed it afterwards. So you could say you were the author of the complaint? I was an author of the complaint. Who was the other author? I mean, you're going to have to define what you mean by authoring. I physically typed the words into the, comp the, uh, the complaint itself. Yes, I physically typed it based on uh, d discussions and reviews of documents. And cons and were you my attorney? Yes. So you were representing me? I was. And you were the one who gathered this information to be factual and, and use this narrative to put it in this complaint. Are you not representing that complaint as your efforts and work in the investigation of this and as the as representing me as my attorney and not just a typist? Objection. Objection. My, my testimony is that I, yes, I, as your attorney, I prepared the complaint. My point is I was not the only attorney or individual who, uh, had input into the allegations contained in the complaint. My You're asking this gentleman to read in, to the record, ten pages of an exhibit you've already marked to this deposition. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. You understand that there are time limits to, that time limits to your ability to examine this witness, and you want him to spend the time necessary to read ten pages into the exhi uh, into the record. Yes. Okay. I, I object to the representations that have been made about the authorship of the uh, Exhibit A. She's been brought in as a witness or put in as an affidavit, but we have established her as a uh, as someone we use for input. And I also say and want this on the record that it mirrors almost exactly the complaint that Mr. Renner authored. So, what mirrors? Objection. Ms. Prezzuto's narrative and chronology of what went on. Objection. If you want this witness to read 10 pages, we'll allow him to do so. Slowly, please. <laughs> Morrison Mahoney as malpractice counsel. Backstory. The initial introduction to Nick Alexander Slowly. came through Rob Fitzgerald of the Lorenzi Group, Perens, originally hired in the divorce case to be an expert witness with regard to computer hard drives, close Perens, in the summer of 2011. Rob F. had originally been hired by Jonathan Ross, Perens, formerly of the now defunct Wigan and Nori, close Perens, as a computer expert to testify in my divorce. When Mike Gill eventually hired Bob Jutras, we were still engaging Rob's services. Rob and his company do a great deal of work with the New Hampshire legal community as legal experts with regard to computer forensics. In July 2011, Rob F. had a strange reaction to attorney Bob Jutras as new divorce counsel and attorney Marisa Pizzuto who Bob hired to help with my case as to the children's issues. 
With Bob only having been in the case for approximately two to three weeks and digesting the previous four years of litigation from nearly 35 bankers' boxes, parens, disheveled and completely unorganized files of all previous divorce counsel in the case, case close parens, Rob F. literally went over the top wild yelling at Bob that he wasn't serving his client because he was not addressing the evident unethical and sleazy behavior of opposing counsel in the case. Of course, this would seem to be the right thing to be saying if one was highly concerned for Mike Gill. Rob F. proceeded to accuse Attorney Jutras of failing to have opposing counsel arrested because his client had been in contempt of an order in the case. That is where Rob lost credibility since he was so outraged about something that didn't make sense. He kept saying he had seen this done many times before and that attorney, attorney Jutras was committing malpractice not to have opposing counsel arrested. This was so ridiculous and distracting to the case that Marisa Pizzuto sat Mike Gill down and respectfully requested that he speak to Rob and inform him, him that he really didn't have proper understanding of the procedures in such a case and that having opposing counsel arrested for their client's alleged contempt actions was actually not possible. Shortly thereafter, Rob F. calmed down and offered instead to help in connecting with a good Boston malpractice firm. He raved about Nick Alexander at Morris and Mahoney and how he had witnessed him do these th kinds of malpractice cases before and that he thought Nick was great. In or about August of 2011, Mike Gill did meet with Nick in Boston and went ahead with hiring him and the prominent firm of Morris and Mahoney. An attorney-client fee agreement was signed and reta retainer paid to Morris and Mahoney. Nick offered Mike an apparent deal he couldn't refuse, $200 per hour and 10% of the case. Uh, bracket. It is noteworthy that Nick is in the technology litigation department at Morrison and has never done malpractice litigation, which he only told Mike in May of 2012. The firm represents on their website that they have a professional malpractice department within the firm. Attorney Alexander is not in that department. Close bracket. Wigan and Nori and Jonathan Ross, Mike's previous divorce attorneys, were suing Mike for $100,000, and that opened the door for the first of the malpractice suits, and this was the starting point for Nick and Eric in or about September 2011. What Bob and Marisa did not know is that simultaneously, Rob F. was steering Mike to another divorce attorney. However, Mike declined to interview the divorce attorney. Rob called Mike to encourage him to reconsider this Boston divorce attorney who was willing to only charge $200 per hour. Mike declined as he was satisfied that attorney Jutras was honest and had begun the work in the proper way. Thereafter, Rob F. seemed to perform as you would expect an expert witness to perform his services, and he and Bob seemed to get along fine. No issues were ever raised by Rob F. again. This was another professional in my case and paid me, but not working, and paid by me, but not working in my interest. Bracket. Uh, question. Why would Rob Fitzgerald advocate so zealously for Mike Gill to sue the very law firms that his company, the Lorenzi Group, is often hired by. Their own business does a high volume of work with the New Hampshire law firms involved. Close bracket. Uh, bracket. FYI, Alex Walker had also attempted to dissuade me from hiring Bob Jutras. It was known that Bob was honest and couldn't be controlled, and they didn't want outside eyes looking at the case. Close bracket. Nicholas Alexander and his associate, Eric Renner, began their work in early September. Generally, their posture in each discussion was to minimize many of the claims as too difficult to prove. 
Mike Gill then asked Marisa Pizzuto to help transition the case, which would save time and money, as she had already helped organize the 35 or so boxes of files and helped prepare the divorce case. There was a sealing order that was in effect in the family court, and the plan was for Marisa to focus on transitioning primarily the facts and documents relating to the legal matters handled by Alexander Walker and Divine, Millimit, and Branch, and other matters unrelated to the divorce proceedings. The issues with Alex Walker and DM were a large portion of the issues, as Alex Walker had really quarterbacked all of my legal matters, both corporate and personal, since 2002. Right off the bat, we had an issue of finding New Hampshire counsel to be a placeholder in the New Hampshire court, since Nick and Eric were not licensed in New Hampshire. Morrison Mahoney employs literally hundreds of attorneys, and not one of them could represent Mike in the New Hampshire courts. The Morrison Mahoney website shows many, many of their attorneys with New Hampshire licenses. Nick told us the three lawyers in their Manchester, New Hampshire office all had conflicts with Wigan and Nori. He implied they had worked directly with John Ross, although it wasn't clear what these relationships were. Wigan and Nori had been around for about 100 years as a domestic relations firm. All three of the Morris and Mahoney lawyers in Manchester do some kind of insurance and or commercial litigation. The Morrison Mahoney website doesn't mention any previous careers at Wigan and Nori or domestic relations practice. We end up having Henry Hyder be the placeholder for Morrison Mahoney in the malpractice countersuit. Henry had been representing MSI in some employee related litigation. Henry Hyder admitted to Mike Gill that Alex Walker approached him parens, via phone call. Close parens, right off the bat upon knowing of his representation of Mike and MSI. Since that time, Henry has exhibited serious anxiety and expressed a flat-out refusal to represent Mike in any lawsuit against Alex Walker. Henry Hyder. There is an issue with having Henry in this case, or in the case, because Alex Walker got to Henry right away and intimidated him into playing on the opposing team. This was obvious right from the beginning of working with Henry. Henry told Mike Gill that Alex Walker called him as soon as he was aware Henry was working with me. Thereafter, Henry acted very nervous and has been sporadically absent from the case and then reappears only to call with probing questions to Mike. Marisa and Bob. Nick never would entertain my concerns with regard to getting Henry out of the case. Even John Friedman had offered to make the connection to an attorney in his office who was licensed in New Hampshire. Marisa, Pizzuto, and Mike Gill made several requests by email and in person that Nick contact John Friedman for many reasons, including the New Hampshire Council issue. He ignored these requests and found no other options despite his obvious ability and resource to do so. Whenever Mike raised concerns about Henry's true position, Nick would convince him there was no issue with Henry. This situation felt increasingly strange as time went on. Henry remained absent from the case for long periods of time, and at one point demanded that Mike sign a release for him as to any potential allegation of conflict of interest for representing MSI, parens, in the position which Alex Walker represented me for years and never raised any concern about conflict of interest where my ex-wife had been partial owner of the corporation. Close parens. Neither Henry Hyder nor Nicholas Alexander ever mentioned that there had been requests and communications with counsel for Divine, Millimant, and Branch as early as September or October 2011. Mike Gill never found out they had been in communication until approximately April 2012. Mike was not copied on any of the written communications. They had, in fact, upon an oral request, received all uh, if... DM and B internal emails 
since 2002 without any formal request or complaint being filed. Mike Gill had made several requests himself and through Marisa to have Nick speak directly with John Friedman as John had represented MSI in front of the Massachusetts Banking Department and certainly had very relevant and important information and perspective. Nick simply would not make the call. When the news came out about John being appointment to the Massachusetts Board of Bar Overseers, we shared this information with Nick, thinking surely this would prompt him to understand how valuable John could be to this case. Still no contact. Finally, Mike was strenuously requesting that everyone that was on his team sit down at one table and pull together a strategy. It was beginning to feel too much like Nick was being a cowboy and that things were being stalled. Mike requested such a meeting to include John Friedman, Bob Jutras, Marisa Pizzuto, with Nick and Eric. Nick called Marisa to say that he would probably meet with John alone. No explanation or rationale given. Nick finally did, in fact, reach out to John. Nick and Eric met then with Marisa and Mike. In fact, any communication with John was always done specifically without Mike or Marisa present. Nick would not allow John to even be conferenced in on calls we had. Nick and John have never actually shared any information about any of the conversations they have had with me. In retrospect, we have compared with John some of the information Nick relayed about their conversations, and it appears he was manipulating the information between me and John. As Mike continued to grow more impatient with the time that was passing, a few interesting things happened. One, star witness Darla Sedgwick was an associate working on my case at Wigan and Norrie and was named as a defendant <coughs> in the counterclaim malpractice suit against Wigan and Norrie is interviewed by Nick and Eric back in November 2011. Parens. Darla was let go from Wigan and Norrie at the time Mike fired the firm and she moved to Oklahoma. Close parens. It was a very strange day that started out as marked for deposition and turned into an interview. Darla seemingly gave some very helpful information to us that day. However, she left without signing any kind of statement or affidavit. There was a whole orchestration put on in which she dramatically fires her attorney, who appears not to be representing her interests that day. But he doesn't leave and continued to sit in the interview. Nick acted shocked and appalled at the situation. End result is that after all the drama, Darla leaves for Oklahoma not having been deposed and not having signed a single statement. Two, Nick repeatedly told Mike Gill that the management at his firm does not want him to work on his case. He told Mike that, however, he is just so devoted to him as a client, he is prepared to leave Morrison after 21 years and go to another firm and take my case. He emphasized that finding the right firm might take some time and he was in the process of looking, etc. This went on for months and continued right up until the present. He just kept saying it would take more time, a few more weeks. Nick told Mike that he had engaged the services of a public relations firm, Thompson Communications in Middleton, Massachusetts, to help manage our media campaign. Funny thing is that Morris Mahoney was willing to do the contract directly with Thompson, but would not sign the malpractice complaint. When Mike arrived for the first meeting, parens, Nick, Eric, Marisa, Thompson, and me, close parens, Nick first met alone with Dave Thompson and then brought us all in the room. Again, Mike Gill was never told what was in the conversation with Thompson. This was the pattern. Four. After this meeting, Marisa received a call from Nick in which he literally yelled at her about our inability to sue the NHBD because MSI had been in violation of some regulations in 2008 and that John Friedman told him about these violations and that this would prevent us going after the banking department. He was yelling at her for not vetting those facts. 
Funny thing is that she had provided a narrative of the facts which included information about the 2008 violations to Nick and Eric about a month previously. Further, Nick was told these facts verbally by Mike and Marisa, so his accusation that she had not vetted these facts and that John had stated... Uh, that we could not go after the NHBD was very odd and was an attempt to intimidate her. Nick was further telling Marisa that she shouldn't believe everything Mike is saying just because he is an intimidating salesman. 5. Marisa had found a NHBD consent order online earlier that same week which proved that the star character in the Implode case, Brian Battersby, had been exonerated for NHBD violations a week or so after he testified in a deposition at Divine Millimet in the Implode case. Nick didn't react with enthusiasm to his finding, to this finding, which is strange since it helped prove a motivation in Mike's case. Six, Nick had always said Mike would not get a fair trial in the state of New Hampshire and we needed a federal judge and the only remote chance was to get a RICO charge. Then Nick said that John specifically said not to sue the NHBD. John Friedman denied stating this to Nick. 7. Nick told Mike in approximately May 2012 that he is not actually a litigator and we will now have to actually hire another lawyer to litigate the case. Mike fully believed he was hiring a litigator when I hired him and Eric from a prominent litigation firm. <coughs> All of the sudden, oh, eight, excuse me. All of the sudden, at the beginning of May, Eric becomes frantic to draft the complaint against the 21 defendants due to their concerns about the running of some of the statutes of limitations. They were forcefully targeting the, fi targeting the filing date as May 11. Despite Mike's repeated request, they flat out refused to include attorney Tara Schaff of Tober Law Offices. She played a major role in Mike's divorce case and particularly in the loss of my relationship with his only daughter, which has been the very most difficult part of this entire legal fiasco. Nine. The other issue about this complaint was that Nick was telling Mike that he would have to be filing pro se because of Nick's status at Morrison Mahoney and because he couldn't put their name on it and once he was settled at his new firm, he would sign on and there would be no issues. He claimed he was very concerned about the running of the statute of limitations and it just couldn't wait. Nick said for months he was leaving Morrison and he kept moving the date further out and this was a stall. Mike now doesn't believe Nick had any intentions of leaving the firm and taking Mike's case because he was just so devo devoted to the case. In fact, he now believes that due to a conflict of interest, parens, <coughs> Morrison Mahoney's sixth largest client is the insurance carrier for Divine Melamit, close parens, Nick was again stalling and running out the statute of limitations, which is already turning out to be the exact thing happening. Nick waited until Friday, May 11, to call John Friedman to see if his firm could sign the pleadings in the interim until he could step into the case. It was represented to John on the phone that Nick had already reached out to the parties to let them know that he would be signing on. Nick never indicated to Mike that he had made any contact whatsoever with any of the parties. After Mike fired Nick and became angry about the pro se filing, Nick told Marisa that none of the parties had any knowledge of the complaint, parens, not yet served, close parens, and that organizing a settlement meeting would be time consuming and he couldn't make it happen right away. Then he went on later to sign an affidavit for the family court in which he stated that he had told the parties in advance of his intention to sign on to the complaint after, Mike, after making Mike file pro se. 10. <clears throat> on May 10th, Eric forwarded a draft to Marisa and Mike. 
there was very apparently still a volume of work that was needed on this nearly 80-page document. Nick doesn't appear to have been supervising this drafting at all. Marisa took the initiative to set up a conference call to go over the document line by line to make sure the facts were correct, etc. <coughs> Eric made the statement to her that he really just wanted to get it filed on Friday to get it done. It was shocking that a firm of the caliber of Morrison Mahoney was willing to file a document in that condition and without review by the supervising attorney. 11. John Friedman was called the very day to sign the pleadings for documents he had never even read, and Morris Mahoney knew the fraud that had been committed and didn't want their name on it. Although Mike didn't receive an invoice for legal fees with the name of the firm on it for 43K, since catching Nick, he has repeatedly called Marisa to see what she knew about why Mike was upset with Nick and Eric. They were particularly interested in whether Mike was having financial problems. <coughs> the pleading was filed on May 14 in a very, very rushed fashion. Mike filed pro se, and Mike felt very uncomfortable about doing this, but felt intimidated that there may be statutes of limitations running and filed the documents under duress. Okay. I like to get a glass of water if I can. Uh, as long as I get extra time. And I also wanted on the record that Mr. Duggan gave us a little lecture about taking this time, and then he immediately asked Mr. Renner to talk slow. Well, what if we have evidence right here? Not just evidence, absolute evidence. You know, an omission of guilt. Let's go on, let's go over shortly who's on it, all right? But let's start by saying the representative of the corrupt was Bob Curley from Curley and Curley. He's representing Morris Mahoney. And Morris Mahoney was representing all the other law firms, the, the AG's office, the banking department, the IRS, the Vimeo, all of those. Steve Tober, he's on the list. Maybe you, remind me that I, remind you that I told you that he was corrupt. He was my wife's attorney. He was the one getting him through statutes of limitation. He wants a release. Jim Ten, my divorce attorney from 10 and 10, right? New, New Hampshire Bar President, right? He wants a release. Dave Dupree. He was my lawyer, too, from McLean Law Firm. Remember I told you how corrupt McLean is and in control? Well, they want a release. Wow. Tim Coughlin, another divorce attorney. Now, what is it with all these that they want a release from all criminal wrongdoing? Well, let's see how. Matt Kozel, the ex's attorney, Ronna Wise. She was her attorney, too. Remember I told you they destroyed the records? Well, there they are. What would they want to release from if they didn't destroy the, the mental health records? Alex Walker, the guy suing me, who I said tried to murder me. Well, he wanted a release. He was the president of Divine Millimat. Dallas Sedgwick. Another one of my attorneys who went and told me what was going on and is in hiding in Oklahoma. She wants a release. Remember, I want you to remember the words of Steve Gordon. Preposterous. Well, let's go on. Jonathan Ross. Maybe you remember the UB, the jury. These are the same times that Judge McHugh kicked the whole thing out. Asked the jurors to leave because I was kicking his ass. Right. And now they're trying to take my house off a one, mil, one month bill, right, on criminality. Well, Jonathan Ross wants a release. Henry Hyder, another attorney that I told you Walker extorted, he wants a release. Maria Pursuto, the same woman who's so worried about her life, who called the state of New Hampshire and the officials of New Hampshire evil, she needs a release. Bob Jutras, another one of my divorce attorneys, whose job was to get him through statutes of limitations. He wants a release. 
Listen, I'm not making all this up. This is signed, by the way, too. Let's keep going on. Maurice Gilbert worked for Divine Millimet, the DRA. Didn't I tell you he was corrupt? Go back to all my videos. Now, I remind you, too, we found this two weeks ago in one of our ex-attorney's computer. I was never meant to see this after I told him to go stuff it. John Sparkman, the VP of Divine Millimet. Larry Schwartz, only the accountant on the tax returns that I told you was forged. Grant Thornton, who took the company over, who knew it was criminal. Lisa Tracy. Now why would Lisa Tracy want a, a release if what I wasn't saying was true? Right? Don't forget Lisa Tracy. Do you know the case with Shaheen and Gordon in front of the judge, his recusal was Rosenberg. Who do you think Lisa Tracy's attorney was? Rosenberg. They needed someone to trust to leverage Lisa for the silence of Shaheen and Gordon. Right. You see these text messages right here? Remember the ones that threatened my kids' lives? This is Ted Little. You see an email between Ted Little in 2013 and Shaheen and Gordon, Nolan, trying to get the, the evidence. That he said in the text that they destroyed. What if I can tell you you showed legal documents about your divorce you have never seen before? This is the same guy who was requesting the files from Shaheen and Gordon. This is why they're protecting their own criminality. Ranging from Mr. Walker to your ex to Lisa Tracy to the attorney that represented her and Jim. So the person that worked for me asking for the files that they destroyed... It's also telling me in, e, in text messages that he's afraid for his life and that he can give me this. The same guy he can give me is the same recusal for the judge. Okay, let's go on. We've got more names. Preposterous, remember? Tony Aguirre, another attorney. There was a mole. Tim Powell. Wow, well, wait a minute. Tim Powell is only an IRS agent. Remember the same one that everybody thought was crazy, saying, what, uh, the IRS? That's right, they use the IRS and leverage them. That's what Shaheen does. And that's why Tim Powell of the IRS wants his release. Dr. Prasad, remember the therapist that I said had the records? Well, why does he want one if they didn't know they were destroyed? R.P. Saunders. Uh-oh. You know where R.P.'s from? Shaheen and Gordon, right, who corrupted the divorce, who leveraged for the 100000 This was Bill Shaheen's boy. Tom McMillan, another attorney. Rob Fitzgerald. He was only the computer expert. Remember I said they were getting into my files? Who do you think was breaking in? Friedman. Friedman, John Friedman's the only one that I said in deposition. He said the banking commission was the worst, the most corrupt he's ever seen. Right? So was he. He wants a release. Little. You know Ted Little is? The text master is afraid for his children's life. He wants one too. Donald Smith, the lawyer from Wiggins. Jerry Edelton, lawyer from Wiggins. James Filler, IRS. Tom Roberts, IRS. Well, wow. Marissa DeLinks, the lawyer for Dallas Sedgwick. I mean, we're into what? Three generations, four generations of corruption. I guess if this don't work, who's left? I don't know. We're fighting Gordon and Bill Shaheen now. I, I think the only ones left might be Satan. Nick Alexander, Eric Renner, my attorneys for Morris Mahoney. Mark Hartley. He's the top guy at Morris Mahoney. He wants a release. But I want you to pay particular attention to the next ten entities. Right here. Okay? So I just gave you a bunch of lawyers and so forth, and politicians. Williams and Conley. The whole company wants a release. Their accountant firm. Divine Millimat. Wait a minute. Walker, the guy still with me? They want a release. Wiggins and Nori, the same people take them out. They want a release. The Eternal Revenue Service. Hold on. The IRS wants a release from me. 
Now, when I told you they were covering up, they had a mole in the company, that was a hard to believe. Even when you heard them on the phone, forgetting to hang up, saying there was a mole, they want to release. New Hampshire Banking Department, uh-oh, what did we say what they were doing? Only money laundering and protecting the drug dealers, then tell me why they want to release. The New Hampshire Department of Revenue Administration, you know, the one who's been leveraging me for my silence for over, what, 12, 14 years? They want to release. You see what I'm saying here? Now I want you to know, notice this one last name that I've been saving for you. And that is Bill Shaheen. Bill, you want to release. You and RP. And that goes as to 2013. 2013. So it isn't all that long ago. Right? Here you are here, Bill. William Shaheen wants a release in 13, July of 13. All right? So here you go. So boys and girls, I want you to see this too. Ready? This is signed by them. Here is the disclosure that they wanted me to sign and you didn't see me sign because I didn't sell you out. You see the people on that name, on that, on that page? That should tell you the level of the risk that we have in this state. That is a signed confession. They just couldn't imagine someone would say, stuff 50 million. Well, here's the evidence. And they signed it, boys and girls. We found it in one of the attorney's computers. There's no doubt. And there's no doubt that Shaheen and Gordon are trying to cover this up. That was in 13. I've been fighting these guys for over 10 years. We are right in our sights. We have them exposed. I am telling you there's a cross current going on in this state right now that we have got to stand up and fight together. 